Today I'm joined by Dr. Nisha and Mark from The Path of Zen, and today we're going to talk about uh, Dr. Nisha's book, which I'm really interested in. It's called uh, Bridging Science and Spirituality. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Close. Yeah. And I <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my memory is not as good as it used to be. Um, yeah, so... This is a very interesting topic because I'm always interested to see what's going on out there outside in scholarly land, in, 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 uh, in uh, intellectual land when it comes to, in science land, when it comes to uh, spirituality and science uh, because uh, the, there's a skeptic community, atheist community, there's communities obviously that uh, are not aligned to Buddhism. And, um, you know, I'm, I really find it interesting when someone attempts to do something like this like bridge, bridging spirituality and science you know people have tried over the over the over the over time but there's not many people who have actually gone and uh, published books and done a lot of study on this and I think Dr. Nisha has done this so uh, I hope we can all lend ear and uh, we'll uh, we'll hear what uh, Dr. Nisha has found and what she's working on and uh where she hopes to go with this and you'll be able to find Dr. Nisha. Um, I put a link in our first, uh, in our first uh, video called Buddha relics. There's uh, Mark's link to his YouTube channel and also Dr. Nisha's link uh, to her uh, uh, YouTube channel. Uh, but hopefully Dr. Nisha is going to join Buddhist cafe and join forces with us mm -hmm. and create a Buddha relics group or a science and spirituality group. Uh, on Buddhist Cafe, which would be great. Not that I'm twisting your elbow or twisting your arm or <laughs> putting you putting you on the spot here. No, I'm no force, but uh, it would be that would be great. So, Dr. Nisha, uh, let where I guess this is a big topic as you discussed uh, before we started this interview. So, I mean, you know, where do we start with this one? Okay, mm -hmm. so I guess start somewhere. <laughs> well, for, first of all, I just want to answer to your question about joining Buddhist Cafe. Well, you know, one of my favorite things in all the world, which gets me out of bed at 4 a.m., is coffee. Kenyan coffee. So you said the right thing, cafe. I'll be delighted to join you, okay? And I think yeah, so we're talking, so, yeah. <laughs> so, the name, so the name does work. <laughs> it works very well. Buddhist Cafe, it's inviting. It's um, a place of meeting, right? It's a cafe right. you're meeting. And you are not just dilly-dallying, you're working on something. I, I wrote Bridging Sounds and Spirit in many coffee shops. You know, bits of the manuscript was actually created in the cafe. So I like the Buddhist Cafe. I like your naming of it. So I just also wanted to say hello to Mark in New York there and <laughs> greetings to you and good morning to you in Thailand, Bante. Good morning. So, um, you know, I'm a medical doctor. I, I think in a certain educated, you know, I can't get away from it. So, um, and, and as I approach today, the science of the relics, it is astonishing, beautiful, and it really is exciting because on the one hand, it resurrected my love of science. Before I came to the relics, I thought science could never touch spiritual realities or spiritual states, and certainly not Buddha relics. I was wrong. And then you have to also realize that the spiritual states are part of human. We are that. We are spiritual beings. And so... When I look at the whole thing of science and spirit and Buddha relics, it brings it together. It closes the whole circle. It really does. Okay, It's how you ask the question and how you gather the data and how you interpret that. We have all of that. Okay. I just want to say one thing. I want to read something to set the tone about the relics. And it is from Shodan Rinpoche. And this is from the book, The Power of Holy Relics to Change Minds and Bring Peace. And he says something really quite wonderful. And he says this, it is much, much, much more meritorious to see relics of the Buddha 
than to see other holy objects, such as statues or stupas. It is like seeing the living, breathing Shakyamuni Buddha himself. You must tell people this. So the relics, you're looking at Shakyamuni Buddha. I wouldn't have understood this 10 years ago. I do now. And I say, thank you. I say, thank you, because it changed my life. All right. So the other thing I want to just say before we start into the scientific dialogue is that my story is like a phenomena. And when you have a phenomena, it's a fact. Phenomena are fact. We cannot just say, oh, it's placebo. Oh, I don't know. It's one off. It's a fact. So would keep you, that in mind. Would you say that uh, phenomena has any, uh, when you experience phenomena, that <clears throat> could be uh, classed as anecdotal rather than fact? When you have millions of people having this similar or identical phenomena, it's not anecdotal anymore. You cannot mm. even say anecdote. Uh, it, nope, disagree. <laughs> I hope that answers right. your question, but it's a good question because we fall into, oh, it's a one-off anecdotal report. This is not that. This is millions of people. And to observe well, the, well, there's, there's three traps, right? There's mm -hmm. three things that science always, the consensus always dismisses things. One, anecdotal. Two, placebo. Uh, or two, sorry, two, two. Um, so, yeah, it's placebo and anecdotal. And those two scapegoats um, work very well for consensus freaks consensus nerds in the science community specifically well, when we talk about you know large-scale medications or large-scale like you know the the vaccine for example um or you know like for example the the uh the drug viox yes. and how long that how long that took to come off yes to stop selling that drug and you know that was a long time ago but they're examples of where the, the consensus for a long time saying it's anecdotal, it's placebo, it's not true, blah, blah, blah. But, and then you had millions of people saying, and thousands, well, millions of people saying, no, this is actually happening. But the current, even today's current science ignores this fact. And that's mm -hmm. what's really interesting about your. So, so this, is, this is a very important point, Bante, that when. Um, as I put together my experience in a paper, I was shattered, shattered in a really good way. I was turned inside out. And I needed to put this after I saw the relics and what happened in my own home. And I was very fortunate because one thing is true. In a peer review process, the reviewer has to be sensitive enough they have to be open enough to understand where we're going. And a lot of science is closed because the review process itself. And I would say also this, scientists must have a spiritual foundation. Are they meditators? Are they reading scripture? Or are they deeply atheists inside? And I think science suffers from the deep atheism, it may not be out there. It's called relativism. Everything becomes my point of view. So you get equal balance of truth and complete BS given the same airtime. You know, we have to be careful about this. I'm going to call that out. So would, would you say, would, would you say that? <clears throat> sorry, there's a lot of stuff you're saying, and I've got a thousand questions now. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, please please feel free to to join in. You know, don't oh, let me uh, dominate. Sure, I, I would just say that um, when I was living in Las Vegas, I did video with um, stage a stage magician, and he was hiring me to videotape his performances. He wasn't like really uh, um, a celebrity. He was just one of the minor a minor uh, stage magician. But one of the things that he commented was that people expect to see magic, so therefore they see magic. 
And this goes to a lot of playing to what people expect to see. So it was in, it was an interesting statement that he said. And it's sort of like, because he did a lot of hip hypnotism. And the reason I was filming things was for, <clears throat> was for his liability. But mm -hmm. he also kind of said that if somebody goes to a hypnotist show and they're called up to the stage, they kind of expect to be hypnotized. So they go with it. It's sort of like a self-fulfilling prophecy or the old, the old saying, you see what you want to see. And if you want to see angels, you're going to see angels. Well, I've got yeah. a question for you, Dr. Nisha, quickly. Mm -hmm. So while we're on this point, let's define what science should be and what it shouldn't be. Because, and, and I'll give you my definition and then you tell me what you think. I've always thought science, when I studied science as a kid and uh, also at university, Right. I always thought science was supposed to be the discovery, um, the discovery of new things, but also to break barriers, to, to break to break certain knowledge barriers, to never be satisfied with 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 certain knowledge, to go even further, to always question, mm -hmm. to never settle into a consensus, into a dogma. And that's what I think has occurred today and for quite a while. Mm -hmm. It's like we tell you, we it's like pharmaceutical companies, the way they train doctors. This drug does this, that's all you need to know. This mm -hmm. drug does that, that's all you need to know. Mm -hmm. Rather than explore, but science uh, was quite wonderful a long time ago in the West because it was all about discovery and not conforming to consensus, but always break. I mean, there is there is need for consensus at some point, but consensus halts growth in science in, in major ways because it doesn't allow for discoveries and if, if someone discovers something sometimes it takes 30 years for it to mm -hmm. be approved yes you know so th this is i guess it's just a human fallibility that we have but uh yeah i th i think i think that so yeah, you're uh, you're saying absolutely correct. You hit the nail on the head, the consensus, the dogma. So what happens in scientific dis discoveries that are unusual, like Tiller's intention experiments or the relics of Buddha, what happens is that unless you conform to a certain set of accepted ways, it's it's um it's sort of well, we don't understand it and we're not going to publish this. It, it literally has happened, okay? So the agreement, what happens is you only see um, certain avenues of discovery, if you can even call it discovery. It is same old, same old. And in certainly in medicine, it's biochemistry, biochemistry, chemistry, chemistry, Okay. And we know that subtle energies play a huge role in healing. Where in my medical education, Bonte, did I ever even learn about subtle energies? Nothing. I don't even remember one lecture on consciousness. These are incredibly important in the human healing. So you are right that science has shot itself and closed its doors, unfortunately. And the experts... They can, they'll only agree on this, this, this. And so there's an agreement, but we're sort of doing the same old thing again and again. And so when I look back to 20, 30 years that I've been in medicine, if I look at every pipeline of rheumatology medicines, it's always biochemical. And if there is even a hint of something new, it takes 20 or 30 years to just get a peep through the door and they'll medicalize it. We'll get a new device or something. But really it comes down to, if we have something like subtle energies, we can teach each other. We have a responsibility to awaken to the gifts of subtle energies and healing, self-healing with our hands, with our breath. We can do those things. And not only that, it augments conventional care. I've not said we just brush that aside. We use the excellence of science and we augment it, reduce side effects, reduce healthcare costs. These are absolutely possible, but we need 
the enlightened reviewers. Where will we find them? In fact, I'll tell you today, an email came across my desk that Dr. Manik, we need to get continuing medical education in the US about spiritual pathways to healing. And I said, this is a very eminent question. But who is going to take these questions to the American Medical Association or the uh, boards that give CME, as we call it, CME credit? They themselves have to be very open to the idea of spiritual healing. That's why I say, have they been meditators? Have they looked at these questions with a clear eye? I'm, 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 I'm questioning that because we'll shut the door again. We keep on saying, where's the numbers and where's the hard science? We fall. They, actually, they call this soft science. It isn't yeah. really. It's not. It, it, it isn't yeah. a soft science. No, I think they're the soft science because they've, they, they, they've fallen into a comfort zone, which is nice and squeaky and they get very well paid. And, you know, the business agenda. See, the problem with a lot of problem with science right now, especially in the medical field, is that you've got the business aspect that's mm. that's taken over so it's not good when a drug has or uh has gone 15 years of research and then you know finally it comes out on the market but then someone else finds something better now we're mm -hmm. gonna have to appreciate this this doesn't as a business model this doesn't work as a scientist it works but as a business model it works and this is why there's an old saying particularly in ancient chinese medicine where medicine and business just cannot be together Mm -hmm. It's like yes. if you're if you're a healer, if you, if you like, for example, in the acupuncture world, Chinese medicine, you're going to be poor all the time. You're going to be poor. That's part of being a good healer is being poor. Mm -hmm. Whereas that that model has changed, uh, you know, immensely over time. And uh, I forgot where I, where I was going with that. But the the thing is, it's like a scientist. If a scientist, oh, that's right, soft scientist, hard scientist. A hard scientist will go wherever he is skeptical, wherever wherever he or she or they uh, are skeptical to learn, to prove themselves wrong or to prove themselves right. A soft scientist, a scientist that falls into comfort zones and is lazy and is not partaking in any due diligence anymore, is not going to go that further mile for discovery. Yeah. Yeah. You just said it. So it's that business model. There's a collision. It's not serving the ordinary person very well. Okay. There is an over-reliance on this science, which, okay, let me, let me put it this way. By their fruits, you shall know them. That's Jesus's teaching. And when you have spiritual healers, and I have met them, and Buddha relics is spiritual healing of the very highest kind. It's top-down science, as I call it, not bottom-up. This is a high level of nature. And people are healing, spiritual healing. The fruits are very good. The fruits are excellent. By the fruits, you shall know them. Now, let's look at medicine. If you ask the same question, by the fruits, you shall know them, you just mentioned Vioxx. You just mentioned all of the things that we are... What have we done? Where are the fruits? Are they, are they good? Are we really improving people's lives? I have my doubts. That doesn't mean I'm not a doctor. I still look at all the data, but I'm always curious about the spiritual lessons. I really am. To me, doing all levels means excellence in biology or physical well being with nutrition and whatever drugs that might be required but there's always a thoughtful process. Then you have to open up subtle energy work. I teach them that and that's free. You don't need drugs with subtle energies. And get this, what about intention? Can you teach them that? Of course you can. And I ask my patients, what gives you meaning? What does God mean to you? And let me tell you, 100% of the time, that's doing all levels. You're not just ignoring, you know, spirit, oh, it can't be, you can't go there. You can't go to intention. They all have value because you open up the, the, the person's, oh, 
I am in charge. It isn't just, she's going to give me a script and see me in three months again. So I think doing all levels is a turning point. And medicine, when I first entered the profession, I used to do that much, much more. And then suddenly I found myself in just drugs and you're right, you know, the pharmacy rep comes and here's samples. So it's all okay, but then it wasn't. Now I'm going back to that, especially with the relics, what they've shown to me and what the physics of consciousness has shown to me, that this is, this is scientific way of living. This isn't even soft science, spiritual living is the best way to live. It's the juicy way to live life, okay? So we are joyful. We can navigate the turbulence as the world throws to us. The world is not stable. We don't know what's coming down the pike tomorrow, okay? We know that. But we can turn to spiritual practices and prayer and just reorientate ourselves, find our equipoise. That's health. That's health. So, I, I so I do have some comments. I've I for one have always been a bit skeptical of those that claim to be spiritual healers or that they have spiritual practices that will uh, heal. And you see a lot of that within the Qigong movements and other types of. Uh, Let's say it's more of esoteric uh, Chinese medicine or esoteric Buddhism. My 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 question then is is how do you scientifically what would be the process in a scientific mindset to actually consider how would you evaluate and actually test a spiritual healing like a meditation or a posture or some sort of ceremony or ritual that claims to heal? Mm -hmm. Th that's an excellent question. And actually, it's part of the relic um, science. What actually is going on in uh, consciousness research, the way Dr. Bill Tiller did it, was he found that first, human consciousness is very powerful. We change our minds too much. We waver too much. Intention is an, a specific aim about something. You can write it intention. That is now getting a little bit laser-like. You're not just a little light, but you're getting chiseled. Then he found something that was quite marvelous. And I think this is the missing piece in consciousness research and in manifestation, if you're calling it that, okay? And that is the physical space itself it changes. There are more than one realm. You have one realm, but you have other realms, the higher realms. When you enter the space where the Buddha relics are exhibited, you're not in an ordinary space anymore. The ordinary physics is not, it, it, it's not the same physics. It's a higher law, but it's still lawful. Okay. When, what do I mean by lawful? One of the nature's laws that scientists agree on universally is the laws of energy, thermodynamics, old science, really old, and no one's been able to poke a hole in it. So what happens in the relic space is that space is not only conditioned to a higher level, but it has tremendous amounts of free energy. When you go into that space, you are energized. That energy is now coherent. It's not just chaotic energy. This is coherent energy that has profound biological effects. Your cellular structures, okay? So, And I've, I've observed it. So the relics are not only these are conscious objects, we can show that, Tillers, we've actually done this work. This is what I discuss in Bridging Science and Spirit. The intention of Buddha is contained in those relics. Okay, so we can see right away that consciousness survives physical death. 
That's the first thing we can actually say. Second, human consciousness that is very high order, like Buddha, will imprint objects like a relic that survives thousands of years. They're still here today with us. We can say that for certain. Number three, those relics, wherever they're housed in a room, that room is not the same anymore. In fact, let me give you an example. When the relic case came to our home, an ordinary living room space that where you, you know, read a newspaper and drink coffee felt like a Westminster Abbey. Felt like a high cathedral space. Seconds. How is that possible? What is going on with the intention contained in those relics that raise the symmetry of a space? I'm using the word symmetry here. Symmetry is everywhere in nature and physics to solve complex equations of quantum mechanics. There's symmetries in those states, okay? I'm going a little bit deeper here, but just remember symmetry. And in the relic space, this is a higher symmetry state. And in that, in that space, you are going to access energies that are really now freely available. Let me let me get in there. Yeah, look, from a no, I'm gonna go into monk mode now. I'm, I'm gonna step out of I'm gonna remove my science hat and I'm gonna go into the monk, put my monk hat on now. <laughs> it's good to have different hats. Okay, so in Buddhism, um, we talk about the Buddha having perfected all the perfections, all the different disciplines, uh, all the knowledges. Now, of course, in science, that's just hearsay and it's just, yeah, whatever, right? But in Buddhism, like in our text and what the Sangha, my Sangha elders, what we talk mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there's certain monks out there as well, who have developed many perfections as well. So this is something that uh, when you come into the Western framework of thinking, particularly the skeptic, the skeptic plus the consensus, the consensus and uh, the consensus scientist st style and the, uh, the skeptic who likes to stay within consensus and never venture out and explore and open up. From there, there's a huge jump or a huge, or maybe I'm not a jump upwards or downwards, but like a space or a distance between when we talk about in Buddhism, what you're talking about, for example, meditation, staying in jhana, when the mind becomes absolutely concentrated and steady, mixed with it with with solid laser-like intention, as you said. Mm -hmm. See that that is a real thing. That mm -hmm. is a real thing. But uh, like Mark said, how do you measure that? Well, <clears throat> it's difficult to measure things that are measureless because the potential of, uh, for example, a laser-like mind when, when it's fully encompassed like the Buddha was able to get into concentration, there's marvels that can be achieved, right? There's marvels. There's so many things that can be achieved. But to the science mind, to the skeptical mind, and to the, to the, to the, to the mind that likes to, to not go beyond boundaries, this is unacceptable. Well, I have good news for you. <laughs> you can put a number on the effects of conditioning of space. And this was really quite fantastic for me because then I saw the relics and Tiller's work being parallel. Uh, can I share, um, let, me, let me share a screen, okay? And let's see if we can, uh, and I had a, a few slides on that. Let's see if I can, and I'll go to, to that particular aspect. The screen share is loading, hold on. Okay, I want to. Oh gosh, I've got to squeeze my eye. I need to get my glasses <laughs> out. It's okay. Um, so let me, let me speak to that because I think it's what you're asking is so important. How can you quantify 
intention. That's what you're really saying. And I'm not talking about the brain. I'm talking about energy. And when we're talking energy, we're really in thermodynamics. Okay, you, you, you've got to know, hang on here. Um, well, you have to know this. I can't see the buttons for the slideshow here. But you got to know the law of thermodynamics, okay? And what Tiller showed, I'm going to go straight here, is that... This is going to twist everybody's brain. <laughs> I know. Okay, okay. No, okay. that's good. That's good. No, that's good. That's see, good. see, that's see, good. see we, we live here, Bonte, in normal reality. And what Tiller found is that with intention... And now I'm talking even Buddha relics, and we'll come back to that. But with his experiments with a human physicist who meditates every day, he's not an ordinary scientist. This is what I'm saying. This man was able to condition with his intention to a higher gauge. He calls it gauge, symmetry state, where now you have a higher reality where things are manifesting in material things, water, enzymes, fruit flies. I won't go into that, but we want to ask, what goes on here? Can you see my arrow going round and yes. round there? So really, we're talking that the space, the physical vacuum of space is a blueprint to a reality. And that physical is vacuum is absolutely quantifiable. This is physics nomenclature. I'm not talking any woo-woo or crap. This is physics, okay? I'm jumping you through here a little bit. I apologize, but we're on that topic, right? So here's the thing. Just let me, this is what's called doing due diligence, people. It's painful. It's like peeling an onion, but eventually you get more knowledge out of it. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> we 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 have you know I had a lot of slides and and Bonte, you're right. We don't want to give a lecture here, but I want to talk to the similarities of what Tiller did because he imprinted a device which went on to condition the space. Think of it as like a plastic relic, but it was simple electrical device. It was wrapped and protected and transported to Minnesota. He was at Stanford University and the experiments were conducted. Just look at the parallels. Relic of Buddha, it's a device. It's wrapped and protected in the stupor and in a relic case, transported on a van, in a van, manic home, monastery, university. There are similarities, right? Here's the thing about the relics. It is part of nature, but it is an excited part of nature. It's what physics calls meta-stable. It is not at equilibrium. When you are around relics, it is a very high energy state. And over time, it will lose energy, but it's always being pumped up. With as intention is there, we go and see it. Oh, and it is constantly absolutely renewed okay this this intention of a avatar like buddha i would just say don't mess with it okay so so i want to bring this concept of meta stability it is the time a system spends in um a high state of energy it's not back to equilibrium and doesn't lose all this energy this is the the living room and it was like we were in standing in uh, buddha relics uh, i mean in westminster abbey and and these are pictures of, of the space this is a camera a canon camera that captured something quite extraordinary this bands of light. This was many, many examples of this exist around the relic tour. This is another one. Here's another one. I can go on. So. Yeah. You know, in Thailand, this... in Thailand, there's a lot of these kind of photos mm -hmm. um, that lay people take in certain monasteries on certain days with relics and with certain monks. 
there's a lot of this going around, but these things are seen by the skeptic and, and, you know, like I said, by the, by the conditioned scientist in, in the consensus scientist is ridiculous. Well, we God bless them and we keep our inquiry intact. That's it. That's, that's all I'm concerned That's exactly, about. that's, I'm glad you said that. See, this is what I'm saying. A scientist, like, a, like someone who's a seeker, must always keep the eye open that there is possibility that you're wrong, that there's a possibility that you're wrong, that there's also possibility to learn more, never to yeah. think it's done. No, see, that's, you, that's where the arrogance comes in when you think. Yeah. See, the Buddha said one Dharma about this. He says, be careful of saying uh, only this is the truth, nothing else is the truth. Yes, yes. Well, the sort of viewers that Bhante, Mark, that we're speaking to are the seekers. Right. Okay, and truth is not a popularity contest. I, I don't care if there are millions of people... I really don't. This well, is the truth, as I understand. I, I, I'm just saying this for my, for, you know, for people watching the video, trying to help people understand that these, you know, subtle differences. Right? Well, you oh. know, the, the other thing to say about Bhante, to, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting, but we have to understand right. that the relics are not 3,000 years ago. They are contemporary. We have observed these phenomena over and over again, just a few years ago. So we are able to catalog and understand and get books like this written, okay? So, or me, or many other scientists who have also been there, but cannot fathom it. But you can start there. You have to start somewhere. And Tiller Science opens the way to the space. And the space is a very marvelous clue because you can quantify that. And that's what we did. Here's what I did. I took Tiller's imprinting devices and plugged them under the relic table, okay? We did that. So there, these were imprinted with the Buddha's loving kindness essence or energy, you might say. And I took one of those and gave it to Dr. Tiller and said, okay, let's see. Is our hypothesis correct? Do the relics of Buddha really change the space where they are housed? And number two, can we quantify that? Okay, so that's what we did. Because whenever Tiller, Tiller found that whenever you change the pH of water, I, again, we haven't been through the whole slide deck here, but just bear with me here a bit. Tiller with his intention was able to change the water's hydrogen ion concentration. And he found that when the water goes alkaline, the pH goes up, it is a measure indirectly of the state of conditioning of the space. And with simple thermodynamic calculations, you can find out the excess thermodynamic energy of that space. And that's what we did. That's what we did with the relics of Buddha. Now, let me just go, because it's it's a lot here, as you can see. So we were able yeah, to... Yeah, like we don't, yeah, we can, we can save it for a part two. There's no yeah, we can save it for another. But let me just scroll down, because I want to show you something. First of all, our hypothesis is correct. A relic increases the gate symmetry of the space where they are housed. You just feel it. it. You call it the Buddha field. You call it consciousness field. It is different, okay? And in that space, much is possible. Our biology is different. But Tiller was able to calculate based on our experiment with the pH. We put a pH meter, the relic imprinted device and measured things. In thermal energy terms, the effect of Buddha relics is very large. It's like the room would burn up, but the room is not burning up. It's not on fire, okay? What happens is that the temperature calculated difference 
is not just energy as in fire or something like that. It's information. I'm introducing a new term here. Buddha, his intention is what? It's information. Information and energy are related together. They're intertwined. Yeah. This, 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 is, this is where we come now to the law of thermodynamics again. And in the brackets, you have entropy and information. They're related. And when you have information like Buddha's intention, it, in, it, it increases coherence. You're now laser-like in that space. Am I making sense? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because you can, you can quantify it also if you've yes. ever gone and seen Buddha relics or you've been to um, the places in India, this, this, you can, this it's not just experiential seen. now. It's not just a phenomena. We can start putting numbers on it. You might say this is the thermodynamics of love. I used to joke about that. Actually, I put that yeah, in well, the let's, let's not go in that. Let's okay. not go in that direction. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, it, but it is okay. We, we can go back to when you talk four, about love. You talk about love, though, like seriously, you talk about the conditional love, like the mm, mm, I love you. No, you no, know. no, no. I'm talking about loving about kindness. You're loving talking about kindness. goodwill. You're talking about yes. metta, right? Yes, You're about metta. The yes. You're talking about unconditional, yes. right? E equanimous, 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 equin equanimous metta is what yes. you're talking about. <laughs> to all living beings. So Buddha's heart, his bhakti, his loving kindness towards all sentient beings is in that relic. And it conditions that space. And you can measure that space to quantify. Whoa. And I'll tell you this. We had to even finish the experiment because that graph went like rocket up. Okay. Um. We can continue in part two because there's a lot of beautiful things here. And I talk about it in Bridging Science and Spirit. So oh, when sure. I say, mm -hmm, um, yeah, we, we can, we can, we, we can start to wrap it. But before you, before you have your last word, can formless consciousness qualities such as love and kindness be encapsulated in the form of a relic? Okay. So you're still using the term loving kindness as meta. Uh, there's a big debate within the Buddhist community now that uh, one, there's a school that says, particularly one of my teachers, he says that metta, the literal meaning of metta actually means goodwill, goodwill for oneself, goodwill for others. The old translation of metta used to be loving kindness. Well, it still mm -hmm. is, it still is. But the actual literal translation by some Pali experts call it uh, goodwill. Okay. That's point. That's point one. Uh, so that's it. Could be trivial. It's it's not that important. Um, number two, formless. Okay. So the Buddha, uh, the Buddha explains there's three worlds. There's the sensual world, up to the sixth heaven, where you know from from hell to the sixth heaven. There's sensual. We've all beings have uh, 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 sensual beings. You know, we've got senses. And then there's the form world, which is like a bit more advanced. It's not so sensual. It's it's a lot of bit more refined. And then you've got the formless yes. realm, right? Mm -hmm. Now nibbana is not in any of these realms. It's beyond. Yes. Okay. So one thing I want to put here, which and we can leave it for food for thought. We can talk about it some other time. The the thing that um, you're getting at here science is you know, what you've shown is uh, is quite remarkable but one thing that always baffles me when we, we try to look at the relics this is one thing that always ba baffles my scientific mind is see the buddha talks about nibbana he talks which is beyond formlessness conscious because consciousness is still bound in the five aggregates is still bound in the three worlds mm -hmm. the buddha has gone beyond consciousness yes where there's where it's empty, there's no self, right? They think about that. There's no self. There's absolutely no self, right? So what 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 the Dharma is 
is beyond consciousness. And that's what the Buddha achieved. So the relics, the, the, the thing that confuses me is because the relics are a physical thing, they're a form, they're, they have form. But I don't know if it's consciousness because the, con the Buddha went beyond consciousness, but he also went beyond form. See, it's, it's not, not so cut and dry here. So I'm one starting to think that the correct term for the, um, after listening to you and listening to this study and what I've been thinking about and reflecting on the star, I think the relics just are represent, reflect the mm -hmm. Buddha's powers, the Buddha intentions, but the, what the Buddha's developed, all the information that the Buddha developed on every single cellular level which is left behind that physical reality that still exists. But it's, but it's, to me, it's, it's not, not even energy anymore. It's the only word I can come up with is power. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I don't know any other word that you could call it, you know, or, and power. And then the next definition would be that cannot be that which cannot be defined. Yes. Yeah. You, you, you raise a very important point here. And that is um, consciousness form, and it's going beyond. Why would what 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 what's the purpose here, right? I mean, these are these yeah. are form. These are form, and and is it really his intention? I'll tell you this: the mind shifts every time around the relics. Even looking at pictures of them, what is it about this that? Yeah. Um, if I look at the portrait of Bhagavan Krishna and a portrait of a relic of, of Buddha, the mind is affected somehow. My mind, and I cannot deny that. I cannot say, oh, well, it's just anecdotal. It's not, because I've seen this, not just in myself, but everywhere. So what is it about avatars, this, this Krishna consciousness and Buddha consciousness that we cannot... We're going there, and I think we're at least going into the invisible realms. We're at least talking about it, and we're having yeah. a, a method, a yardstick to just say, we have a way to get there, and we're using words like symmetry, coherence, physical vacuum where there's nothing. There are fields. There's no material stuff. There's no particles like electrons and things, but it's a reality in how we can start to get the ladder of understanding, okay? So we have to meet there. The scientist has to meet there as Tiller did. And Buddha in his, I can tell you this, Buddha has extended the hand to us. If you read Bridging Science and Spirit in pillar number seven, I do write about this. It's, it's a lot for today. And we'll do one more session on the science because I think let me put it this way. Buddha answered our prayers because the experiment, I'm making it very simplified here. Hey, we imprinted a, a device. The hypothesis was this, and we proved our hypothesis correct, that the relics do condition the space. Not only that, it changes the pH of water, and we have calculations, and the room would burn up, but it didn't. It's informational. We have all these things, right? Right? But there was a step I'm not telling you here. And that was so remarkable that to this day, I get chills just thinking about it, that these aspects of Buddha nature of answering questions is very alive. It is not just beyond. It will answer you in a prayerful way if you are sincere. And there's no vested interest for Tiller and me to do all this. We were literally yeah, no, like no. scientists, like, let's find out. This is no. this is a clue to consciousness that wow, you know, there's no, no brain. I commend, here. I commend you. I no, I commend you. It's it's pretty uh it should have been done a long time ago. I don't understand why what hasn't been done a long time ago. I agree with you. You know, I from agree. a Western science point of view, you know, they they were so arrogant back a hundred years ago that you know they wouldn't even consider something like this uh, here, here we have a vital clue that there's a high nature it is there you cannot deny this it's there 
we are looking at it, you're shifting. Can we, and in fact, I have given grand rounds on this and said, you can't put this relic in an MRI machine. This is meaningless. How we're studying medicine and, and consciousness doesn't work here. And it was Tiller signs that for me opened the doorway that, oh, wait a second, this is far more elegant, far more eloquent way, mathematical connection that we can now at least open the door and we can see that we ultimately are towards that Buddha consciousness through the intention piece. We can start at least paying attention to that. Intention matters. That's what I'm talking to my patients. What is your intention today being here in front of the camera with me? I mean, they're sometimes startled with that. Like, hey, hello, you know, I just want to, uh, for you to take care of my swollen toe, which we take care of, but we have to get to the human stories again. All right, to the intention, consciousness, spiritual practices. They are very, very core. Now, I haven't talked about the review process of my paper, which was itself beautiful. And we will do we'll that another that. time. Yeah. Yeah, we'll leave, we'll leave. You know, we, we, we can we can do some more parts on this. And um, uh, if you have any comments, uh, uh, you watching out there, uh, if you have any comments, um, any more questions uh, that you would like us three to uh, answer together, um, please, if you, obviously, if you want to um, ask Dr. Nisha questions, please go visit uh, her, um, her channel or her website and ask her directly. Uh, but if you would like us three, uh, Mark, uh, Dr. Nisha, and I, to uh, tackle any questions or comments, please leave it, uh, leave a uh, comment below, um, and let us know. Uh, Mark, do you have any last thoughts before we uh, finish this 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 one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, was, there was a lot going on here today. No, I don't have any comments <laughs> at this point. So thank you. Really, really appreciate this amazing right. overload of information. Oh, it is amazing overload. And I tell you, Mark, it's actually really, uh, send me questions, but it's not, uh, we, we have jumped right into it. Um, yeah, I had so all, next, next one I, we'll do reviews. Next one, yes. sorry, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. Next one we'll do reviews. We'll go a little bit more into uh, more science and other things that you've done. I'm sure you've done other things as well, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll discuss that. And what I want to come up with, uh, if we can, something a little bit that might be a little bit uh, uh, well, uh, adventurous, maybe a bit too ambitious, is trying to find the term that really gives truth to what the Buddha relics, like if, whether it's the definition is consciousness, which I don't think, because I see consciousness as more base in terms that it's a more physical thing. It's got to do with life. It's got to do with the material elements. So I think consciousness is out. I think what we need to upgrade to, to terms more such as power, <clears throat> which I think is scientifically, can be scientifically acceptable. But one thing that if we can jump to is, is just, like you said, inf I like information, but we need to start understanding what perfections are what cultivation and development mm. of the Noble Eightfold Path plus all the developments, all the cultivations uh, that the Buddha went through through many lifetimes to achieve uh, or to realize and become the, the rightly self-awakened one. And that's a big leap, but that's where, you know, hopefully we can get to in our, in our series of, of videos coming up. Thank you for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and share with your friends.